Hello and welcome to the podcast, 10 Lessons Learned, where we dispense wisdom to an international audience of rising leaders. In other words, in this podcast, you'll hear valuable insights that you can't learn from a textbook because it took us a year to learn this stuff. My name is Jeffrey Wang, the founder of Professional Development Forum and your host this episode. I'm a Taiwanese-born Australian living in sunny Sydney. This podcast is sponsored by the Professional Development Forum, which helps diverse young professionals of any age to find fulfillment in the modern workplace. Today, we're joined by Garj Ravinchandra. Garj is a managing partner of Compass Consultancy. He's also a psychologist, careers and talent expert, and performance coach, with over 15,000 coaching hours delivered internationally. Garj has trained everybody from World Cup winning sporting coaches to business leaders undertaking multi-billion dollar corporate mergers. He has worked with multinationals, governments, educational institutions and sporting teams in Australia, the Middle East, the UK, Europe and Asia. His industry experience covers a wide range of sectors including telecom, finance, healthcare, aviation, technology, manufacturing, consulting, retail and even oil and gas. Garge is passionate about sustainable high performance, leadership development, career pathing strategies and setting fulfillment mindsets for life. Garge has been featured in the Arabian Business, College Times, Thrive Magazine, WKND Magazine, and The Gulf News. And when outside of work, Garge travels extensively around the globe and is the founder and director of several organizations focused on career development, music, education, sports, and a family charity. Welcome, Garge. Thank you. Great to see you, Jeff. And yeah, looking forward to our chat today. Uh, just a quick confession. I know Asian genes are great and all, but you're not really 50, are you? <laughs> I feel it today, particularly in a cold winter in uh, Sydney. I definitely feel uh, older than I am, but no, I'm not 50, mate. I'm not 50. I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, mid 40s. That's horrifying me to some extent, but uh, excited as well. Oh, you still look great. So, so. <laughs> that's awesome. But before we jump into your 10 lessons, I just want to throw you a little bit of a curveball. What advice would you give your 30 year old self if you were to see him today? Yeah, I remember at 30, it was actually the time which my wife and my two year old daughter at the time went to the Middle East and we took this huge leap of faith and moved from Sydney uh, to Dubai. And I think one of the things that I would have, I would go back and tell myself is to actually back myself, uh, in the decisions that I made. And I had a lot of self doubt, particularly back then. And you gotta remember, I, I was moved to the Middle East in May of 2018, the financial crisis hit in September. Um, so about, you know, a few months later and massive amount of doubt, self doubt that sort of jumped into my mind during that time. And I think going back, I would just remind myself about the decisions that I made, why I made those decisions and sticking with things and committing to things and not putting so much pressure on myself, um, you know, mm -hmm. to do that. So I think we stuck with it, but I think there's a lot of things I could have said to make life a lot easier for myself during that time. Beautiful. So with the benefit of hindsight, you would have told yourself to back yourself when you're 30. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, mm. just to go for it, right? Unleash yourself and yeah, don't hold back. That's wise word indeed. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. Let's jump into your 10 lessons. Lesson number one, you say that your network is your net worth. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, it's something that's thrown around a lot these days, but the big lesson that I've learned is that there are many reasons why our relationships are really important to us. And, you know, a lot of the time that I spend uh, coaching people is around work and, you know, promotional opportunities and leadership opportunities. And one of the things that I found, Jeff, is that people really overemphasize the importance of their performance over their relationships. And time and time again, I find people get disappointed at their, the fact that their technical brilliance or the fact that they've, you know, achieved their KPIs is not enough, right? For them to achieve the success that they want to achieve. And I think they forget that actually people making these decisions actually are humans that need to feel a sense of trust or connection with others. And if we don't put ourselves in those situations, we don't brand ourselves. And if we don't show people that we can relate to them and connect to them, we are potentially going to be left behind, right? In some of the decisions that are made, because we may not have the connections that we want to have. So performance is important, but relationships and that network that we have are just as important, if not more important, the more senior we get within our careers. 
I agree with that, but it's sort of easier said than done, right? So mm. how, how do you build a network that is thriving and healthy and useful? I mean, it starts with understanding a little bit about what you're trying to achieve. And so, you know, finding people around you that have that shared goal or sense of purpose, and I'm sure we'll talk about purpose later today, but mm -hmm. that sense of connection with them really helps to orchestrate what you do in your day, your weeks, your months, right? And, you know, whether you decide to have them as mentors or, or people around you that, that sort of guide you, your tribe, um, you know, it can be really helpful. And so that I think is one thing. But secondly, understanding what are the you know, kinds of networks that are available to you. So doing a bit of a network map, right. To understand the key stakeholders and those around you that can influence decisions that are important, that carry weight, that may have some sort of political advantage and perhaps have the kinds of mindset and personality that you look up to and admire, right. You want to spend more time with these people. So, you know, identifying who these people are and then starting to just reach out to them either through referrals, which can be a really helpful, easier way rather than sometimes a cold connection. So there's a bit of a strategy and an approach, right? That you would use to kind of get in front of these people and surround yourself with these people. Beautiful. And, and you've got to do it as you go as well. Now, lesson number two, and I feel like we might have, you know, very similar parents, um, growing up, <laughs> <laughs> you say that winning doesn't exist from the comparison game. Now I'm, I'm, I'm sensing, you know, this is something that ha happens all throughout your life, especially people of, uh, an Asian cultural background where you feel like there's a lot of comparing going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you look at uh, social identity theory, right, the idea of, you know, collectivist versus individualistic cultures. And I think, you know, those in the Asian and continental Europe have a lot of these collectivist type cultures where what we do not only impacts us or our family, but our communities, right. And, and the society in which we live, whereas an individualistic society is much more driven by, you know, the success of the individual and how that operates. And so in a collectivist culture, you're going to have a greater chance or likelihood that your performance, the things that you do, the things that you have are compared to other people. And I remember growing up as a child, that was a massive part of, you know, growing up and look at so-and-so, look what they've done, look where they live, look how they're, you know, providing for their family and so forth. That's a very natural thing to do, but it also creates a, a comparison game. And what we know is that the only person we should be really comparing ourselves is to us yesterday. Right. And so mm. that is a healthy comparison. The rest is unhealthy. Um, we can use potentially others as role models, you know, in, from a motivational perspective, but if we're actually comparing ourselves to them, we know psychologically it can be quite damaging. And so we want to make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons and that there's a win-win, right? It's like when you compare yourself to your competitors, for you to feel good about yourself, the competitors need to lose, right? Mm. For you to win. That's true. And yeah. so. Is that really the game that we want to play here, right? That somebody else has to lose for us to win. And I think that's an individual question, but this is one of the life lessons that I learned that kind of helped me to refocus on myself rather than worrying too much about the external world. Absolutely. And I like what you said, you know, we should be comparing ourselves to what we were yesterday. And that's a much more meaningful comparison that we should be having with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the only way you can have a win-win comparison, knowing that you're a better person than you were yesterday. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Number three, the pillars of life are your values and purpose. I sense there's a good story behind how you came to learn that lesson. You know, one of the things when we started our business compass about nine years ago, I was working in the corporate consulting world and it was very much about, um, working for somebody else's vision or purpose. And so even though mine was tied to that, it was never going to be completely mine. And so what I went through was a process of discovering what that purpose or the intentional career was that I wanted to have, not an accidental career, one where I'm just going down a path of being good at what I do and then getting promoted or given opportunities, but actually purely intentional. And I had to go back to my values to actually know, well, what were the things that were important to me? And how were they going to be demonstrated? Because values, the only way you can see them is through our behaviors, right? And so yeah. when we actually get to live our values at our highest level, that's when we get to optimize ourselves. And you know, the leaders that I get to work with, and I feel very fortunate, you know, these C-suite executives and top talent coming through the organizations, they have this in common. 
they have this absolute clarity around what is important to them and how they need to then navigate their purpose through their values and through their behaviors. And so, you know, those long-term goals of, of purpose, if you like, you know, where you might feel you want to do good things in the world and have a good impact and also to do something that's personally meaningful to you has to be driven by your values. There has to be a connection there. And I tend to find the people that are unhappy, even though they've achieved some amazing things in their life, they've typically had to do it almost in contradiction to their values, right? And so there's this feeling of being unsettled, unhappy disconnected. And so those two things have to go hand in hand. No, that's certainly true. Especially you know, uh, through my own experience, I do find that uh, you have to be authentic to who you really are in order to feel that sort of sense of fulfillment. But, um, but that's easier said than done though, because it takes a lot of courage to live authentically. I presume you know, there's probably a, a moment in life where you realized that you weren't going to be fulfilled without living out your values. You know, is, is there a story behind that? Uh, probably lots of them, Jeff, but I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that uh, come to mind is, you know, working for a particular boss, uh, when I first moved mm -hmm. to the Middle East, who did not have similar values to me. And I had mm -hmm. to make a decision at a time when, you know, the economies and the crisis was taking place to leave. And that was not easy to do, but the decision was made based on this values misalignment. And I needed to find somewhere that was better aligned. So though it was the more difficult decision to make at the time, because it created a lot of instability, you know, for my family, I knew that in terms of the longer path, it was going to be much more aligned and more meaningful to me. Well, that must've been a pretty courageous decision. I think my wife definitely helped, right. To make that decision, which was great. Yeah. And it worked out in hindsight. It did. Yeah. One of the best decisions I made. Absolutely. You know, through the discomfort comes triumph, right? And I think sometimes we need to go through that. Lesson number four, running towards success rather than away from failure. Yeah. Again, being a collectivist culture uh, and Asian backgrounds, I think, you know, we're used to running away from failure, right? And, and uh, <laughs> this came up a lot. Uh, in my first graduate job, actually, you know, I was going as a consultant psychologist and I got a call the day after the assessment center uh, by the managing director at the time. And she said to me, look, Gaj, we want to take you on board, but we don't want to take you on as a full-time consultant. We think you've got this ability to do this commercial sales type position. I said, well, I don't know anything about sales, right? I think you might be talking to the wrong person on this one. She said, well, actually you've got one of the highest fears of failure, um, that we've seen. And we know that for sales positions, that that is a really critical personality disposition. So we want you to give it a go. And then she said at the end, but I want you to think about one thing. And that is instead of running away from failure, take that energy and run towards success. It's a lot more fun. And I think that stuck with me. That's 20 years ago. And it, it stuck with me, you know, to this day. And I think whenever I go through those moments of where my mindset is shifting to the anxiety and the worrying and all the rest of it, I need to start also remembering to rebalance what that means from the positive perspective. And I think that re-energizes, right? Automatically re-energizes, right? In lots of positive ways. Oh, indeed. Your mind's a powerful thing and you can't really not think of something, you know, when I say, don't think of a pink elephant, but what do you think of? And I think there's one of those things, if you're always worried about failure, you know, and you're always thinking about failure and that tends to be what manifests, but I had to chuckle because I can relate to that so much. Bringing shame to your family is probably one of those things in our culture that uh, you're trying so hard to avoid. Uh, and yet, you know, that sort of underpins that fear of failure, um, so much in our culture. So thanks for sharing that. Now, lesson number five is probably going to cause a little bit of controversy, which is why I love it. Uh, you say that every person should have a therapist now. Come on. <laughs> every person? Surely I'm, I'm okay, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think there's a couple of things wrapped up right in that comment. I know it is a bit of an extreme position. However, mm -hmm. I think it's quite valid. And here are my reasons for validity. This is just my perception. I'm slightly skewed on this, of course. So as we have a GP, a general practitioner for our physical health, and that is widely accepted and recognized and normalized. If we haven't learned anything over the last two or three years about how important our mental health is, then I think we also need to consider that perhaps in the same way that we have someone to go to 
for our physical health that we also need to value our mental health. Now, there's two parts to this, right? So the first is, yes, we need to have someone to support us in our mental health. The second is, it is not just when we are in trouble, when we are feeling that we are down. It is also when we just want to improve, when we want to keep moving forward. There's a reason why the elite athletes in the world have many coaches. They have people that work on parts of their body, on their diet, on their mind, because we need support. And they're at the top of their game, right? And I think sometimes it may be even a little bit arrogant to think that we don't need somebody just to help us along, that we can do this all by ourselves. Well, the reality is no one's ever done it by themselves. And in fact, if we've got access to people now who are specifically trained to support you mentally, why wouldn't we take that as a life advantage? Why wouldn't we think about it not as a deficit in our life, but as a privilege and an opportunity? And so I think in the same way we look at GPs, maybe we need to look at someone who is a therapist or a mental coach, right? To support us in that journey. Oh, I love that. I love that. And it's an interesting uh, way to look at it as well. Uh, yeah, a lot of people see uh, needing a therapist or needing help is a sign of weakness. And I agree with you, you know, we need to turn that around and see it's like getting a coach and having a bit of advantage in life. Now, the other side of that coin is, and this might be again, a, a Asian cultural thing. Why would I pay for a coach? Where is the value of that coach? And, and I know this is specifically a, a very sort of professional services driven mindset that you have in a lot of Asian cultures. How do you overcome that mindset? Who am I to afford a personal coach? Yeah. And I think it's ironic because, you know, a lot of the Asian parents, we will pay for a maths tutor for our children. <laughs> Who is the coach? That's true. Right? And yep. so the idea is that actually all we're doing is we're applying that to our mind. And mm -hmm. in the same way that we want to give ourselves an advantage and by giving ourselves an advantage, guess what? Our families get an advantage. And I don't know anybody who doesn't want to provide the best for their families. So I'm trying to connect these things in a way when I, when I talk to people about the kind of support that they might need, that this is not just an individualistic, egotistical purpose. Right. There's actually yep. some significant value for your family, your community, as a result of you optimizing who you are and what you can bring to the table to get the yep. most out of yourself for you, your family and your community. Right. And I think that's an important message that we need to send out as well. Absolutely. And we need to see it as an investment of time and value. So, you know, when you get the best help, you get the best results and the help more than pays for itself. So love that. Lesson number six. Mental toughness is the most important leadership skill and mindset to develop. You know, Jeff, I saw this piece of uh, this statistic about, about eight and a half, nine years ago, which changed my view on why I think this is probably the most important thing to pin down as a leader. When you look at performance and how individuals perform and lead intelligence, IQ mm -hmm. accounts for about 7% of uplifting yeah. performance and capability. The components of mental toughness account for 27%. And when I saw that statistic, I thought to myself, why are we not talking about this more? This is obviously really important. And here we are on one level rewarding, you know, people that we call geniuses. I don't know. People call Elon Musk a genius. I don't think he's a genius. I just think he's a visionary. I don't think he's a genius, but I do think that he's been able to be exceptionally resilient. I think mm. he's able to have confidence in what he's able to deliver on. I think he's able to control his life and, and the lives of those around him and, and his emotions, except when he's on Twitter. And then we have, uh, probably, uh, the last one around overcoming challenges and obstacles, you know, whether you look at, you know, failed rocket crashes, right. When they're returning back to the earth or issues mm. with the Tesla's auto drive capability, he keeps coming back. And so I think it's actually not his intelligence that has driven him to be successful. It's actually his resilience and mental toughness. And of course, you, you've got to be visionary. You've got to do all these things and have a great team around you. But I think that's a fundamental pillar. That is one example, but I see this time and time again in people in their careers and the way they lead. When you look at those factors of mental toughness and resilience, they are the ones that actually result in a higher chance of success for people to be able to achieve what they need to achieve. Indeed. And I could relate that to a TED talk I saw before, Angela Lee Duckworth, and that was on the one single attribute that is a predicator for success for kids is grit. 
And I think grit's just another word for mental toughness. It's not so much how many times you get you know, knocked down, it, it's how many times you get back up that ultimately determines it, you know. And I think this is the reason why you do want your kids to learn sports as part of their upbringing because, you know, that's where they develop a lot of their grit and mental toughness. Because as you're growing up, you know, you're always going to be smaller than everyone when you're playing, but you're overcoming all of those adversities. But ultimately you realize that the triumph is not that you're going to be winning all the way. Uh, and in fact, if you did, you would probably not do very well because, you know, at the first sign they'll fade there, you know, that's when everything collapses, you know, and mm. I, I'm thinking on the top of my head, uh, a perfect example is um, Ben Simmons, who was an Australian born basketball player yeah. that ended up in the NBA as the number one draft. And up until that point, you know, he's been winning all the way up until the highest level of competition. And that's when he hits the ceiling, hits a wall. And uh, he realized now that he may not have the grit to actually come back from now. Hopefully his career's not over yet and he may find some, but uh, it's just one of those examples where, you know, perhaps grit is something that was missing earlier on in his life because he's done you know, too well. So I can definitely relate to that. Uh, lesson number seven, the things you fear are the greatest growth opportunities. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of this comes back to our insecurities right? The sense of uncertainty in ourselves and also the future. And, you know, when we look at this world, I mean, I think most, most of us have heard of the VUCA term, right? Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. But the next addition to that is BANI, right? So VUCA makes us operate in a BANI world. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's B-A-N-I. So that is brittle, anxious, nonlinear, and incomprehensible, which means Riddle is fragility. It is creating mm. this fragility in us. We feel that life is fragile. And so we need to be super cautious about the things we do and who we interact with. It is making us anxious, right? Because we can mm. to predict the future as much as we could have perhaps 15 years ago or 20 years ago. And so that uncertainty causes that problem for us. It's yeah. non-linear. We can't look at the same path and think this is the only job I'm going to take. And this is the only company I'm going to be in or the, the only industry or division. And so we do need to think about connecting the dots on what we do in our lives and how we operate and take our gigs into becoming more higher earning uh, opportunities for us, for example, as we enter the fractional employment world. And then incomprehensible. There are a lot of things out of our control, right? Now we're talking about monkeypox. God knows what's going to happen with that and, and how that's going to manifest itself. So because of these things, there are lots of things to be afraid of. And we are built as machines to be afraid. That's how mm. we've survived as humans. But so in yep. the last 150 years that we've realized there's actually this untapped growth mindset, right? That we can obviously reach into. And that is so much more exciting for us to then focus on. And that's where a lot of the growth opportunities are generated from, where we start getting excited about what that looks like. So I kind of liken it to superheroes, the DC mm. comics or Marvel characters. It's not an accident that we relate to these characters because they actually represent something in us. Each of mm -hmm. them have insecurities that they've had to work through, fears, problems, challenges that they've had to yeah. then confront to be able to realize a superhero power, something that makes them unique. And I don't want to get too fantastical about it, but I think that is true for each of us, right? We need to mm. confront these things for us to really lift the lid on the opportunities that we represent. Oh, absolutely. And I think the growth and, and the achievement and the sense of fulfillment comes from overcoming that adversity. Although I'll, I'll call you up on that because you, you mentioned DC. So what is, and I'm thinking Superman here and kryptonite and you know, the thing you fear, I mean, <laughs> how does kryptonite represent Superman's greatest gro growth opportunity? Yeah. Well, actually, I don't know if it was kryptonite. That was actually his issue. I think his insecurity oh. was whether he was actually going to be the person that turned his superpowers into good or evil, right? I think it was the idea, it wasn't oh, it. Oh, no, 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 it, no. it was the imposter syndrome, right? This fear of, am I good enough? Is the world actually going to accept me for who I am? That was his mm. biggest insecurity. And so as a result of that, that made a massive difference when he confronted it and accepted yeah. it and decided that he wanted to deal with this head on. His powers were really revealed to him. And I think we have to go through that pain, that discomfort, right? To face it and to see what's on the other side. And it is not an accident, Jeff, that if you look at the most phenomenal talent in any discipline, whether it's business or the top ballerinas in the world, the top politicians, the, the top athletes, 
they've all had to face levels of this adversity mm. to get to this yeah. outcome. It's not an accident. The answers are there. We need to confront these things, but it's hard. It's tough, but that's what also puts the lid on our abilities, mm. but we are always going to be capped until we open that lid and confront it. And do you have any tips on how to confront it head on? Yeah. Get a therapist. <laughs> I love it. It's all connected. <laughs> Lesson number eight, choose abundance over scarcity. Yeah. So, you know, as we were talking about before, we are machines that are built to worry. And so, you know, when challenges come up, it is very natural for us. I mean, our brains are obviously tens of thousands of years old, right? We are mm -hmm. going to convert our thinking powers into concern. And, you know, there's a beautiful Stanford research that said 82% of the things we worry about never happen. So we know all this, right? That, you know, we, we worry about all these things. We operate in this scarcity mindset, which then doesn't allow us to actually realize the, the resources that are available to us. It doesn't yeah. allow us to think more deeply in, you know, the situations that we're in. And so coming from this abundance mindset means that we open up our minds and, you know, the story that resonates with me, mate, is I was talking to a guy who's working at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, this was about 15 years ago. And what he told me was that, you know, I was talking about getting investments for a business that we were looking at. And what he actually said was, Gudge, do you know that there is unlimited money in this world? And I said, what do you mean? Because there's literally unlimited money. So if you're going to have a mindset that there's not enough money for the projects that you're working on, or you know, the charity that you are doing some work with or whatever it might be, you've already gone down the wrong tree because it's simply not even true. So that completely changed the way that I looked at the world. And that meant that I wasn't looking at my competitors or competitors, right. And saying, well, oh, they're going to take this work from me. Well, actually there's plenty of work. I just need to be mm. more creative in how I go about finding it. And so it just changes the mindset and the dialogue in our heads. So is this a case of making the pie bigger rather than how you cut up the pie or? Absolutely. So instead of fighting for small parts of the pie, let's actually realize that the pie is bigger than we think it is. And so then that means how do I then take all the knowledge and the skills and the abilities, connect those dots and offer something that is unique. As you said before, Jeff, being more authentic, right? There's only one version of Jeff out here. So what is it that Jeff needs to do? This podcast is an example, right? Of many things that you're doing. But that's what makes you unique. That's what makes you special. Love that mindset. Number nine, self-compassion allows you to give more to others. Well, first of all, what, what is self-compassion and, and what, you know, why do you need to look after yourself? Yeah. Well, I guess if we look at compassion, compassion is empathy with action. So self-compassion is yes, you might have some element of understanding emotionally what you are doing, how you are engaging with the world and interpreting what's happening in the world. But then you need to do something about it, right? So if you're in a situation that is depleting your energy, if you're in a relationship, either at work or personally, that is not supporting you, then empathy is important. Self-empathy is important, but you have to do something about it. And that is self-compassion. And so that, that's yeah. why it is important. Otherwise you're going to be stuck in the same places. Now, the reason, you know, I used to hate the term self-love, right? When I used to listen to this and I thought, oh my God, here we go again. You know, if we're talking about this, you know, loving yourself and why that's so important. But actually when I sort of dug a bit deeper into this concept, I actually think it's about self-respect right? mm -hmm. and you need to respect yourself before you truly can respect other people. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think if you understand what you are capable of and what hinders you, what, you know, triggers you, where you need to recharge yourself, how you need to demonstrate to people right. what is important to you, then you are in a better place to be able to help other people, right? You, you're better positioned from an energy perspective, a knowledge perspective, all of those things come into play. And so, you know, that can be really helpful. So I think that's my sort of interpretation of that. Yeah. So it's almost like you've got to accept yourself for who you are, warts and all imperfections before you can really, I suppose, set out to, to make the world a better place. I, I remember we had another lesson um, from a, another of our guests and says, put on your own oxygen mask before helping others. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a similar sort of concept, isn't it? You, yeah. you have to make sure that you're, you got yourself sorted and that allows you to have a bigger impact on the world. So. Love that. Yeah. Now lesson number 10, and, but, but before I jump into lesson number 10, I'm going to throw you another curveball. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what lesson have you unlearned? And, and, and what I mean by that is something that you believe to be the ironclad truth that you've always held to be truth until you find out later in life that it just wasn't so. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that sometimes I felt obliged that I needed to have certain relationships with people, family members, friends, friends of friends, work colleagues, whatever it might be. And that I needed to put myself through unnecessary mental trauma and physical trauma to have those relationships. And I think maybe that's a collectivist thing. Maybe, maybe it's not. But I've unlearned that in lots of ways, you know, particularly over the last five to six years of my life, I think I just don't have the energy to deal with people and situations where you know that their interests are not aligned to yours, where they're mm -hmm. perhaps being unkind, perhaps where, yep. you know, they're not being sort of considerate of other people. And so I've had to unlearn that lesson. It was drilled into me as a youngster that you just put up with people and you mm -hmm. need to do that. Whereas now I'm less tolerant, I think, of people who are quite selfish in their approach. Ah, to okay. So, so I'm trying to unpack that because mm. I, I was thinking it could, could go one or two ways. One is, um, that is, you know, it's more like understanding that those obligations aren't sort of ironclad. Those weren't probably obligations that you had to fulfill in the first place, or is it a case of, you know, choose your company wisely, you know, banish psychic vampires as another one of our, uh, <laughs> our guests have shared. Yeah. Is it a case of just, you know, you choose your, your time carefully and only entertain those people who are going to be a positive influence in your life? Yeah. I think being much more selective about the people that I spend that time with. I mean, I think all of us are time poor, you know, I've never met anybody that told me, oh, you know what, this year I actually found that I had more time than last year to do things, hmm. right? I've just never heard that, right? It's always busy, things are always coming up. <laughs> That's true. So it means that we need to really be very selective about the yeah. kinds of people that, and more on the values, right? That sort of similar values piece to us. Everyone's got diversity and different experiences. That's super important. But mm -hmm. when you're meeting people who've got completely misaligned values to you, and you feel like you just have to put up with them for the sake of it, drawing some lines in the ground, putting some stakes in the ground, right? Lines in the sand can be really mm -hmm. helpful to protect yourself. And that that's really important. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And gosh, I wish I learned that lesson a lot earlier in my life. Sometimes I, I lament, you know, I don't even have enough time for all the good people in my life. So definitely I wish I knew that earlier. Lesson number 10, our 10th and final lesson, assume that there is 1% of truth in everything. I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this comes a lot from, you know, my marriage. And one of the things that I found is that, you know, I got married quite young. I was, you know, I feel quite young. I was 25 years old at the time, you know, I've been mm. married now, you know, for 19 years. Mm. And one of the things that I noticed is that, you know, I would come into a conversation sometimes thinking that I, my truth was the only truth, right? And so what it forced me to do, having this mindset of, you know, assume a 1% truth means, well, I'm forced to uncover what that 1% is in the other person's agenda. And so I'm trying to find it. And so it, it, it makes my mind just open up a little bit to get into that mindset to understand. And I think over time, one of the things that I've noticed, Jeff, and I've seen this, when we look at the major problems around the world, whether it's... Yeah. Do people get vaccinated or remain unvaccinated? Mm -hmm. Do people yeah. go to war and how do we use, you know, different levels of, of threat, you know, when war takes place? I find that facts are not the truth. What is truth to me is not truth to you, right? And mm -hmm. I think the more that we realize this, and this is one thing I've noticed, is that don't assume that truths are the same or that mm -hmm. the facts are equally represented. So, okay, you might agree that there is some sort of temperature change taking place in the environment. I may not agree that it is due to humans, right? Maybe it's not a rapid thing. It's just some part of evolution. Now, I don't agree with that. I think there is some sort of impact that we are having as humans. But if I'm open to the conversation to understand a little bit more without blocking that off straight away, then I might actually create a channel for the discussion mm -hmm. to take place. And that can be a starting point or a building block you know, as part of that conversation. It's not to assume that we're going to agree on all the truths, right? Life is way too complicated. 
for that. But there may be some that we can come to once we've got that open mindset. And assuming the 1% is just a reminder for me. So when I'm going into even feedback, you know, from a client, don't okay. get defensive when someone tells you something, you know, that you don't like. Let's try and understand mm -hmm. it, right? From the truth, from their perspective. And I'm nodding in furious agreement because I think this is probably the, the biggest problem facing us today mm. is this hyper polarization of everything. You almost have to define yourself by what you're for and what you're against and all these labels and this incredible need to pick sides when in reality, there is just so many shades of gray that it's impossible for anybody to perceive all the different perspectives. And, you know, in reality to deal with VUCA, which is the more volatility, uncertainty and complexity and ambiguity, we need to have more perspectives, not less. And yet, you know, the media, the shorter attention spans, yeah. our inability to actually see that there's 1% truth in everything in somebody else's opinion is indeed getting worse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, so I like that. And I like the way you, you talk about this because again, you know, another, another lesson we've learned in the past is, you know, that you haven't understood the issue unless you can argue from the other side. And, and that's something that, you know, I, I'm personally pretty committed to and, and uh, passionate about. So in a practical sense, so how do you implement this lesson? Because I know it's a bit of a mindset, right? Mm. You know, that there's 1% of truth in everything, mm. but how do you remind yourself not to get sort of railroaded into a particular view or view or perspective or mindset or, you know, a narrative yeah. in a practical sense? How do you implement that lesson? One of the, one of the steps that I've taken, you know, having these conversations is around choosing to be curious when mm -hmm. going into conversations. And if I'm more curious and I take on the curious mindset, then I'm more likely to ask questions that I am to state my truth. And I find that to be really helpful to just, can you explain that to me a little bit more? I didn't quite understand that. So tell me where that would work and where that wouldn't work and you know, those kinds of things. Right. And so that I find that to be really helpful, you know, so the curious yeah. mindset. I think the second thing is also about how do I find a connection with this person? Because if I'm trying to get to a resolution here, there is no way we're going to get to a resolution if I don't connect with that person. So at immediately, if we start with a binary approach to say, you are here and I am here, well, there is no connection, but let's find the connections. Let's find the fact that, okay, you know what? We both care for our families. Mm -hmm. That's an important connection. We both want to be able to demonstrate love and compassion and whatever it might be, right? So if it's a home context, maybe we both want performance for our teams, right? We want the profitability to be high, whatever it might be find the connections, find those instruments that allow you to be able to, to feel a sense of relationship with this person that can build that web between what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. So that would be oh, immediate very good advice. three things off yeah. the top of my head. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Uh, and, and I think these are the sort of things that we need more than ever yeah. in this world. But I think we all got to start with a humility in recognizing that there's 1% of truth in everything, you know, even if it's just 1%. Let's go find out what it is. And surprisingly, more often than not, there's a hell of a lot more than 1%. <laughs> and I think if we can go into everything in terms of the biggest conflicts uh, in our lives that way, I think we will end up a lot more happier, a lot more successful, a lot, a lot more fulfilled as a result. So on that note, uh, we will finish uh, this episode. Thank you very much for joining us, Garch. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I knew when I read the list of lessons that this was going to be a cracker episode and uh, you have not disappointed. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's been wonderful, man. I'm loving what you're doing on these. I think it's just terrific to have these bite-sized, you know, pieces of knowledge and wisdom, you know, going out and I'm, I'm getting a lot out of the podcast and everything else. So thank you, mate. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And you have been listening to the podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, where we dispense wisdom for career, business, and life. Our guest today has been Garj Ravi Chandra, sharing his 10 lessons learned. This episode is produced by Robert Hossery, sponsored by the Professional Development Forum, which offers webinars, insights, community discussions, podcasts, events, and the best part, it's all free. You can find them online at www.professionaldevelopmentforum.org. Don't forget to leave us a review or comment. You can even email us at podcast at 10 lessonslearnedcom That's podcast at number one zero lessonslearned.com. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss an episode of the only podcast that makes the world a little wiser, lesson by lesson. Thanks for listening and stay safe, everyone.